This is the fictional Mindbender. When we hear the name Star Wars, our first images usually include Death Stars, Space Battles, and of course, Jedi. Or at least with the last one they did, until recently. While lightsabers and Jedi and Sith Lords are still popular and universally considered cultural icons across the world and pop culture, there seems to be a shift as of late in regards to who the new Star Wars poster boy is. And if you weren't paying attention, it's not the Jedi anymore, or even the Sith. It's the Mandalorian, or perhaps I should say, the Mandalorians. While this changing of the guard started back in 2019, when the show of the same name started on Disney+, Plus, Mandos, as I usually call them, have been around for at least the past 40 years over the Star Wars franchise. Throughout those 40 years, the name, the title, and the race that it represents have undergone many and numerous changes during that time, ranging from the expanded universe to George Lucas himself and the recent Disney iterations as well. And what I can say is that those variations are similar, but at the same time, there is a vast difference in their philosophies. Now, originally, the term Mandalorian was a little used name that was used by hardcore Star Wars fans. Same thing with the Sith until the prequels had come out. And initially this had started with actually the prequels in terms of fleshing out and expanding what it meant to be a Mandalorian and what they were about. Now if you were just paying attention to surface level Star Wars, that would pretty much just include Boba Fett and his father Jango Fett, which in the expanded universe before the Disney takeover, they had been the leaders of the Mandalorian cultures known as the Mandalore. Now, during this time, it was established that they were also still a warrior culture and that the Mandalore was supposed to be the head of that culture. However, they had been scattered to the winds due to conflicts with the Republic and the Jedi many centuries before. And again, this is back in the Legends or EU era, not the Disney era. And during this era, while Fett had become the face of the Mandalorians, as they had become somewhat popular among the Star Wars fans at that time, but not universally as they are now, the fact that casual fans were only familiar with his cool first appearance in Empire Strikes Back, where he made a very strong but silent first impression, and his unceremonious quote-unquote death, I should say, in Return of the Jedi by falling into a farlock, excuse me, a sarlacc pit by accident, didn't do much to improve the image of him or the Mandalorians. The EU brought him back to life and made him much more of a badass, but at the same time, again, it was only known to hardcore Star Wars fans, people who read the novels and the comic books. But as far as casual fans were concerned, he just basically turned out to be a bitch. Now, where the comics, the novels, and the game, the Knights of the Old Republic come into play here is that it vastly fleshes out what it meant to be a Mandalorian. Basically that they were originally a race that had originated on Coruscant, had gone to war with the human population there, lost, and were exiled. And this was a, a very, very, very long time ago in Star Wars history, back before there was even a Republic for that matter. Eventually, they settle on a world, name it Mandalore, and develop their warrior culture further, developing the title of the term Mandalore, which could only be given through ritual combat, and was represented by a mask, and this is where the whole thing with the helmet and the mask and Mandalorian culture begins to develop as well. And eventually, the original race dies out, but because they had adopted other species into their culture, because they were, ironically, very inclusive and very progressive in that way, the culture itself continued, as well as the history. A Mandalorian literally could be anybody, or for that matter, anything, I guess, as long as you could fit into a piece of armor and could wear a helmet. That being said, their history is a lot bloodier, which is only hinted at in the recent Disney iteration. Basically, that they had developed their own empire, had gone to war with the Jedi several times, had even allied themselves with the Sith, who had also gone to war with the Jedi and the Republic several times, were responsible for numerous genocides 
and a shit ton of massacres and literally almost brought the Republic to its heels, again, as well as the Jedi. The Disney version of this only hints at this history, saying that they did fight with the Jedi in the past, that they were excessively violent, and that later on their culture was scattered to the winds of space, as it were. This is shown through um, pretty much through the Star Wars show Rebels, which one of their characters, Sabine Wren, is a Mandalorian. And she, through her history and through that character development, we learn about the history of the Mandalorians up until the point of right before the original trilogy. And then we learn during the show The Mandalorian that sometime either before or during the original trilogy, the planet of Mandalore was basically bombed out by the Empire and that that's when their version of the scattering of the Mandalorians takes place rather than centuries prior. Now, some of the massive changes in Mandalorian history happens because of George Lucas himself. Essentially that by the time of the Republic, Mandalore is still a political entity that had actually, officially at least, rejected their warrior culture in favor of the extreme pacifist one under the leadership of Duchess Satine, who had either fought or had experienced the extreme warfare of her heritage, and they had basically sickened her. So she is the one who led to the basic disarmament of the Mandalorians. And also that the title of Mandalore was basically either rejected or decided not to be used. Whereas in the expanded universe, it was decided by writers and people in LucasArts that the title of Mandalore had actually passed down to Jango Fett and which had then passed down to actually, ironically, Boba Fett. And for the record, there were a lot of fans who weren't entirely happy with that change either. So this is not just a Disney thing either. That being said, it did still include during Lucas's changes, the elements that had been established in the EU as well, with the idea of different clans, the scattering of the Mandalorians as a culture, a long history of conflicts with the Jedi and the Republic, and a tendency towards extreme violence, as represented by the Mandalorian faction, the Death Watch, in the Clone Wars series cartoons. Now, at this time, they started to become popular but the Jedi was still kind of the face of Star Wars at this point. Um, again, thanks to Star Wars The Clone Wars. But, at the very least, the, Man the Mandalorians were on the map in terms of the fan base noticeability. Now, another extreme change happens when Disney takes over the franchise. Number one being the Disney's decision to make the established history of Mandalorian culture part of Legends basically making it unofficial and no longer quote-unquote canon, even though, technically speaking, the EU was never actually canon in the first place, which is why Lucas changed it when he was still winning things. However, by the time of Star Wars Rebels, they started bringing back in elements of both Lucas's version of the Mandalorians, as well as the EU's version of the Mandalorians as well. Essentially that, again, they are a warrior culture, have a tendency towards violence and that they live in separate clans and factions. But that being said, the details regarding a violent past are never explored, only hinted at. So the whole genocide thing, never mentioned. Massacres during the Knights of the Old Republic time, also never mentioned. Yet one of the things that they kept from the EU and put much more of a focus on is the Mandalorian culture's code of conduct, or their own honor code, as it were. Essentially, that as a character in the Knights of the Old Republic game puts it, that the Mandalorians in their own way are kind of reflections of the Jedi, and that they are a warrior culture with their own code, it's just that their code is much more different and much more violent. They fight for their causes, and they believe in taking in people of different races into their culture to make them a part of their own. Now, where the changing of the guard happens from the Jedi to the Mandalorians happens after the sequel movies were made. And just as a disclaimer here, 
I am not hitting on the sequels. If you happen to enjoy those movies, great. I have no problem with that. This is just a telling of where the philosophy tends to change regarding the face of Star Wars. Now, I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with the intense drama that went down during the sequel era when they were coming out in the theaters, at the very least after The Last Jedi. The fandom was incredibly split regarding their treatment of Luke Skywalker and that they used the, the Rise of Skywalker to try to repair that damage, only to arguably anyway fail spectacularly. I have seen some YouTubers say that they do actually like that movie, again, which is fine, but regardless, it is still a fact that a lot of people on both sides actually hated that movie. And the atmosphere and the fandom at this point was one of exhaustion. People were just sick of Star Wars, essentially, because it had become so toxic that you couldn't even express an opinion not trying to offend either side. You just happen to like what you like without someone jumping down your throat, calling you either a shill or that you are a racist or sexist or whatever you want to call it. And it was pretty bad. Now, enter Disney Plus and their introduction of the series The Mandalorian in 2019. This show turned out to be a breath of fresh air because number one, it had nothing to do with the original trilogy per se or their characters, so there was room to maneuver without the drama attached to it. And also two, it introduced a character that was brand new to the franchise and to the fan base's mind, which was Din Djarin, a mysterious Mandalorian character who was a ruthless bounty hunter, which thereby re-establishing the reputation of Mandalorians being badasses on screen, but mysteriously also never took off his helmet, so there was an air of mystery to him. Already this is re-establishing the reputation that was originally established by Boba Fett about Mandalorians being badasses and being utterly ruthless and doing whatever they need to do to get what they want. And yet, ironically, it was a non-Mandalorian character in that show that boosted it up to global levels of popularity. And that character, as you know, was Grogu, AKA Baby Yoda. And what this character does is that it sets up a pattern of softening up the Mandalorian's image, making him more of a protector, as it were, rather than a ruthless killer. And even though it's established that he comes from a fundamentalist sect, which honors the old Mandalorian warrior code and history. It also establishes Din Djarin's issues coming up regarding that culture and perhaps the need to make changes or become more individualistic. Now, at this point, you can see Disney's fingerprints all over the place. The softening up of the character, making more family friendly, the lack of mentioning any kind of genocides or details of the extreme violence that Mandalorians were notorious for committing, and the focus on their own warrior code and ethics of honor that in many ways seemed very similar to the Jedi's. And this is where the shift in the fandom culture takes place, I believe. Now, the reason for this shift, I believe, is because of the vacancy of the hero department in the Star Wars fandom. Essentially, that prior to the sequel era, the Jedi were still considered heroes, and again, the face of Star Wars, lightsabers and all that, and you'll still see them, as well as the fact that the Mandalorian has, in, or I should say, reintroduced Luke Skywalker back into the franchise, as well as the character of Ahsoka Tano, who technically isn't a Jedi, but was trained by Jedi and is kind of Luke's aunt, so I don't know, take that for what you will. But either way, the Jedi are still a non-factor in terms of political or galactic influence. There's only two, basically, people they're representing. The Mandalorians, on the other hand, while scattered, are still more than just two people. They're around. Moreover, the show is uh, re-establishing their political entity in Season 3, it looks like and trying to bring the culture back together. And there's a lot of parallels between this and the Jedi, as well as Din Djarin and Luke Skywalker 
take into consideration that both Luke and Din Djarin, at the beginning of when we're introduced to them, are kind of lost. Yes, farm boy Luke isn't going around killing people, but at the same time, he still kind of doesn't know that much about his history or just knows just enough from a certain point of view. Both characters are introduced to the expansive history of their heritage that they are quote unquote born into. And through that link are brought into a much larger conflict and thereby both are trying to or being a part of reestablishing their respective quote unquote orders to bring back to galactic prominence. Where the sequels play a part in this is that they essentially rebooted the original trilogy. The galaxy is once again in trouble and the Jedi are once again betrayed and nearly wiped out and have gone under the radar. Now, what the sequel trilogy was supposed to have done was it was supposed to have tried to re reintroduce the return of the Jedi Order to the character of Rey instead of Luke Skywalker. But given the controversies regarding the sequels, that didn't really take hold, at least in terms of how half the fandom perceived it. So, after the rise of Skywalker, people were just kind of left with this empty hole and vacancy in the Star Wars universe of who to basically root for, because who was left at this point? And this is where the show The Mandalorian takes place. And honestly, you would almost think this was planned out, if, I, if I'm being totally honest, because it seems rather, uh, as it says, serendipitous that at the franchise's lowest point, a new light, I guess you can say, reemerges to kind of reignite the interest and the passion for the franchise, thereby expressed by fans and new fans starting to wear Mandalorian armor at cosplay events, Star Wars events, uh, Halloween for that matter, and so on. Now, again, Luke Skywalker is still a presence. He is still a force to be reckoned with, which is also established in the Mandalorian. But, outside of himself, he holds no real influence. His contribution to the galaxy by defeating Darth Vader is, I guess at this point, pretty much unknown, other than the fact that he blew up the Death Star, which apparently people forgot about, which actually would make sense if you're in that universe and how much time had passed. That's like trying to remember the name of the pilot who put a torpedo in the Bismarck that slowed it down back in 1941. So while I'm not going to go as far as to say that the Mandalorians have replaced the Jedi, as the new heroes of the Star Wars universe, it does put them at the very least on par, at least until there's some Star Wars show that will reestablish the Order as be, again being a very prominent force with good character development and good storytelling. And in that lies the challenge because again, there is now a lot of drama attached to that, whereas before Disney had bought the franchise, there wasn't none. That being said, when Mandalorian Season 3 comes out in March, it's going to be interesting to see where they take uh, Mando, um, him and Grogu, as well as his relationships with the rest of the Mandalorians, and the reintroduction of Mandalore as a planet on screen. If they're going to put it back on the map as a political force, or if they're going to go somewhere entirely different with it. But for me, more importantly, it's going to be interesting to watch the fandom's reaction to both the rise of the Mandalorians and how they see them in relation to the Jedi as far as Star Wars popularity and the face of Star Wars. <laughs>